This is the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. We've been joined, I'm Councilmember Weezar. We've been joined by Councilmember Englander, Councilmember Harris Dawson, and Councilmember Blumenfield. One second, I need my agenda up here. Thank you. Where's the regular agenda? The official one. What happened? What happened? You want to discuss it with the whole committee? No. So um, first off, I want to give a welcome to our newest member of the Plum Committee, uh, Councilmember Bob Blumenfield, who hails all the way from the Valley. Welcome. Thank you for being here on time. And uh, we'll get call this meeting to order. First, we'll go through the multiple agenda item comment cards. These are the cards for which people from the public wishing to speak on more than one item uh, have uh, two minutes to speak on uh, their items. So first up is Wayne. Yes, and a special shout out to all my dog friends. <laughs> yes. So we want to welcome the newest member. It's good to see that there are two people of the Jewish faith on this committee because land is owned mostly by Jews in the country. Take judicial notice, yes. So we notice the departure of Gil Cedillo from this panel. Now nobody will advocate for affordable housing ever again in this committee. The developers now have complete power. Now you don't have to worry about affordable housing. You do not have to worry about the Ellis Act. Now, the people who like you are 100% in control. And yes, even Mr. Harris Dawson, who loves to videotape people like pigs, will remain quiet now, as he will remain there without Gil Cedillo, his affordable housing brother, to worry about. So let's have a, a big hand for the developers. Mr. Wayne, yes. Wayne can you hold this time, please? Uh, you signed up to speak on several items that have particular, right. hold on, that have particular uh, uh, topics to discuss. Yes. If you wish to speak generally about this committee, you could reserve that for public comment. Right now, you signed oh, up for oh, several oh, oh. items, yes, so if you could yeah, well, please, yeah. please speak to those items. Yeah, well, Thank he's you. just referring to the fact of, of, the, of who owns all of these projects, you okay. know, because it's not... All you right. know, because you kicked off Gil Cedillo because he's... All right, that's more appropriate for the general public comment. Yeah, I mean, there. you know, okay. I mean, you could take all these items without Gil Cedillo on item three. You're not, you're not going to advocate for affordable housing anymore. Number four, without Gil Cedillo, there's not going to be a voice for low-income housing anymore. And number five... Without Gil Cedillo, you're not going to have anybody advocating for the lowest... 1% of the people of the country, it's that now what you've done is stack the deck and plumb for all these rich white motherfuckers to get all their projects approved. That's simply what I'm saying. Fuck you. That's all. Okay. I'll take that. Uh, Herman? It's Herman here. I'm talking about item number three, Mr. Bob Bloomingfield, the racist anti-Semitic who took away my five-unit apartment building to create more residential use. Well, those fucking amenities don't apply to me, so fuck you, item number three. And then I go into item number four, since I have to stay on topic from the regiment, motherfucker, white niggers here. CD10, what did he talk about in consult day? Racism, racism. 
but this has to do with zone change, and you restrict white niggas under the city planning commission to draft an ordinance that allows niggas like me to live in honorable parking spaces adjacent to what? At grade level? <laughs> And then I go to item number five, another CD10 for white niggers. N negative declaration? No, stay on topic. I'm trying. It's California Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, which prohibits me to engage in using subterranean parking garage motherfuckers as dwelling units for the homeless. So I agree with Mr. Spinner. You're nothing more but racist white motherfucking niggas that don't like pimps like me to work and live in Los Angeles. And I declare this a war, not a genocide, no. Nor do I call this amnesty. Because once again, under the Affordable Care Act that's fucking suing you, and on behalf of independent living that sued the Jews, now you're asking for Trump to say, for the record, fuck sanctuary cities, fuck plum, and fuck item number seven for time limits because I can't finish under Barbara Dawson. Thank you. With that, we'll move to item, the consent items, items number three and six. Uh, Mr. Mejia, if you could read those into the record and then we'll... Uh, you said three without and six, Councilman? Three and six, without objection. Yeah, item um, three is a report from the South Valley APC. It's a zone change. Um, it's to demolish the existing single family home and to construct a new five unit apartment building. Uh, item six, Councilman, this is a report from the Planning Commission. It's a resolution and a general plan amendment, also a vesting zone change to demolish the existing single family dwelling and to construct a 16 small lot subdivision in CD3. Great, thank you. And uh, that's our welcoming gift to Councilmember Blumenfield. They're both CD3 items. So without objection, so ordered, we'll approve those items. Item number one is a report from the Director of Planning, Mr. Vince Bertoni. Thank you, Chair Rezar and members of the committee. Just a few things. We're very active in our community plan update program. We have finished this summer five informational public meetings regarding the Hollywood community plan update. Their first was held on June 29th and the last one on July, July 19th. Um, and that's following the release of our Hollywood community plan. That was the second version of that uh, community plan, which we've mentioned in the past here. And secondly, we're, we're happy to launch our Southwest Valley community plan program. And we have um, now had recently, even this week, had two community plan meetings, one in Lake Balboa and one in Tarzana. But that's in an effort to update three community plans in the Southwest, the Encino Tarzana community plan, the Reseda West Van Nuys, uh, the Canoga Park, Winnetka, Woodland Hills, and West Hills community plans. So those are three, so far, uh, three plans that we're updating. Um, these meetings have had attendance of anywhere to 50, 100 people. Um, they're ongoing. Um, this is just the beginning of what will be an extensive public outreach for, for our Southwest area, so we're, we're, Southwest Valley area, so we're really excited but about that. We have Councilmember Blumenfield here, who's, who I know has been attending um, those meetings in person and, and staying and listening to all the comments, which has been very helpful. So um, with that, I've just concluded my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. Bertoni? Seeing none, we'll receive and file item number one. Thank you for the report. Item number two. I item two, Councilman, this is a report from the CAO and a draft city attorney prepare ordinance to increase the general plan maintenance surcharge to fund updates to the community plans. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Jason Clean on behalf of the city, uh, the office of the city administrative officer. Um, before you today is a report from our office um, supporting the draft ordinance uh, for the city attorney that would increase the general plan maintenance fee to 7%. Um, half of that in half of that surcharge would support the ongoing expanded community planning program. Um, our office has reviewed the city attorney's draft ordinance and it is consistent with the fee study conducted by our office. Um, adoption of the ordinance will generate approximately $5 million to support the de Department of City Planning's expanded community planning program and decrease the department's reliance on the general fund. 
um, and we recommend adoption of the city attorney's ordinance, and we're here to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you, and thank you for your work on this. Um, this is scheduled to go to committee, I think, uh, to full council August 8th, and assuming that we approve this item, how soon can we expect um, to have staff in place to begin updating the community plans? Um, Probably a better question for the planning department. Yep, yeah. we'll, um, we're in the process of hiring up, and I believe that our, our funding for this next year, excuse me, our funding for this year didn't all start on July 1st. Some of it started halfway through the year, so we in essence had ha partial funding for this year. Also, we're going through the hiring process, just realistically in a hiring process. We will probably be fully staffed probably by next summer. Is when summer we'll be, of? Of, of um, 2018. 2018, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And the other question is, where do we start? Um, which community plan, do we have a list of community plans? Uh, have those been made available to the public? How do we know which ones go first? Or is it gonna be a political fight amongst the five of us here and then the full 15 council members? <laughs> we might have other, uh, Kevin Keller, city planning, uh, no, com no political fighting. Uh, we, um, as uh, Director Bertoni said, we have begun staffing up our community plans. We've launched our first new team, which is our Valley Policy Team. As we stated, we're starting our workshops in the Southwest community uh, plan areas there. We also anticipate as we uh, move through the next fiscal year hiring, we will start two additional teams. Um, those locations, we're lo working through some of the parameters in terms of um, age of existing plans, development patterns, trends, uh, entitlement activity in those that'll help inform that process. We also have some geographic. So before um, you go on, yeah, so it sure. informs it in what way to the ones with more activity go first or get uh, more it, or, or I mean. True, and yeah. there's no, we're not having an exact formula. I think about 10 years ago, we did release a overarching schedule. That's not the goal here. It's to be basically as we complete one sector of plans, we analyze what would be the next plans we can move that team to. So one of the factors could be we're seeing a lot of general plan amendments in an older plan, a lot of change that's happening in that area. At the same time, there could be plans that are not anticipating or seeing a lot of development patterns that could benefit from a new plan. So uh, basically, we're completing this year's work. We'll be completing the South, Val the South LA teams. That team's work should be completed uh, within this next fiscal year, so that could be re uh, launched in another area near downtown, west side, south, that area there. And we also have an additional team that we'll be forming, and we haven't uh, finished that analysis yet on where that plan would start, but we're happy to work with, with you. So it will be an ongoing process to identify which community plans you address, or will you have a list after you do that analysis? And well, let me, maybe I can be, uh, add some to that. We've actually, we prepared a report uh, previously, which I think was delivered to Plum, which lists uh, different criteria we were gonna look at. And I, it may have been part of when we were talking about how we, different ways of updating the community plans and adding certainty in the planning process. And we, we put through there some criteria that, that we, uh, that, that Plum reviewed, and it was things such as how old the plans are, um, what is the age of the plans, how much, what is the, in essence, the population forecast for some of those areas. In other words, did the fo population forecast far exceed the capacity? Um, we looked at things in terms of development activity, like where's the development activity actually occurring? Where are the most general plan amendments and specific plan amendments and zone changes occurring? So you can kind of see the need because the plans are old and we've, we, we have, that's one criteria. The need because the plans are getting changed a lot, that was another criteria. The need because there's a lot of activity was another one. The need because there is, um, the population projection is, is exceeding um, the capacity and also um, issues such as environmental justice and we looked at the Cal Enviro screen in terms of those areas that have some, some um, there's some so, so social equity components to that. So we, we've, we've prepared the criteria. So as we go through the process, we're prepared to go through and see where the greatest needs are and then we're matching that with both when we get our staff up and then how the plans are actually um, completed, they're underway and how we can redeploy those those resources. So we're looking at all those criteria and we're, we're you know, kind of happy to come back. We're looking at, um, in essence, creating over the long term, we're not just looking at, we're looking at trying to get all of our 35 community plans updated by 2024, which as you know is an is a ambitious schedule. But also I think the city's, and I think this council and this committee has been clear that, that, we, that this, the council wants to make sure that we don't just do this, do this effort in 2024 and then just 
forget it after that, is to have a process after that where we can maintain them in a much more timely manner. So we're looking at a system that can both we're looking at a system that can both get them all up to date by 2024 and then segue into a system that actually can maintain them over time in a much more frequent uh, basis, probably closer to from six years to maybe 10 years, but 10 years would be a, a dramatic improvement over what we have today. So, so that's in essence how we're looking at redeploying them, um, if that answers your question. Okay. Um, well, I look forward to seeing some semblance of a idea given all that those criteria as to which may go first, but I think at least one, we have the uh, funding, and two, now we have the, uh, uh, we'll s soon have the, the, the staff to do it, so we just kind of need to know, get a general sense of which are going to come up. In the past, it's been pretty sporadic. I mean, all of a sudden, we hear, oh, the planning department's going to look at this community plan and update it now. We, most of us were thinking, why that one? Why now? So now I think if we give a if we, we need to know, have a general sense of which direction we're going and why and have some rationale to that. I think uh, that's what the public uh, would like to see in here. You're showing a map? No? Oh, it was just, uh, thank you, and I think building off of that, um, referring to the map that's in the council file, we did prepare a five-team map, and I can hand this out. It's in the council file already. Um, so again, we do have a, a large a uh, roadmap of exactly the, where the, the different regions would be with the five teams. But again, within those sections, exactly what the priority would be, we're going to be informed as, as, um, as the director said. So we'll follow up on that with, with everyone here and we're make sure we can provide that information. Thank and you. We're happy to come back to the plum with that okay. for, the, for the conversation. Any other questions or comments? No. Uh, for the record, I want to welcome Council Member Price. Welcome. And uh, so, council members and public, as you're aware, these, uh, today's item follows up on discussions we had in this committee earlier this year and furthers, uh, furthers us along the path to solidify the city's goal of updating all 35 of our community plans over the next six years. I'd like to thank both the planning department and the CAO for their hard work on this. And what we originally anticipated was a 10-year plan. We have now shaved it to a six-year plan, which is very good considering how outdated these plans are. And by adopting this ordinance, uh, we will effectively double the workforce dedicated to community plan updates, and that's very good news. Uh, this final ordinance today puts the finishing touches on the comprehensive overhaul of the community plan update program spearheaded by this committee and the CAO and the planning department. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to move that we note and file the CAO report in as much as it has been presented for informational purposes only, and thank you very much for that work. Approve the city attorney prepared ordinance to increase the general plan maintenance surcharge to fund and expansion of the planning department's community plan program to update the city's 35 community plans and request a report back on the implementation plan to update the community plans. That discussion we had on how, what criteria will, we will use to know which ones are going to be addressed first. So we'll the report back to be both the CAO and the planning department. Or just the planning department? Planning department? Okay, planning department. Just planning. Okay. Any uh, further discussion? Seeing none, uh, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have comment cards now. Item number four. Item four, Councilman. This is a report from the Planning Commission. It's a zone change ordinance. Um, for the construction of a 110-room hotel in CD10. Okay. Staff here for a brief overview on the items. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Oliver Knappern with the Department of City Planning. Uh, so the case that you have before you today is a, uh, a zone change for a new hotel, a 110-room hotel located in uh, the Koreatown neighborhood of uh, the Wilshire Community Plan. Uh, the zone change request, uh, which was approved by the City Planning Commission, was to go from R3P-2 to an RAS4-2 zone change. <coughs> uh, this project was approved by the City Planning Commission uh, on March 9, 2017, uh, and is now before you for consideration. All right. Thank you very much. Samir Santi. Natalie Schumann. Daphne Jacobs, welcome. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, I'm I sorry, spoke about Councilmember this. Ruizar, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. One I understand there's a request from CD10 that might that should probably be mentioned before public comment. 
Okay, we could do that. Uh, one second, please. Uh, Jordan Barraquim from CD10. And I believe there's a proposed change, and so we need to have that up before the discussion begins. I apologize for that. Welcome. Good afternoon. Jordan Barraquim with Council President Weston's office. We, we do have a change we'd like to speak into the record. On March 9, 2017, the City Planning Commission approved a zone change request for a 110-room hotel with 1,840 square feet of ground floor commercial restaurant space located at 679 through 687 Harvard Boulevard. The recommended zone change is from the TQ RAS 4-2 zone. However, it has come to our attention that the TQ RAS 4 would not allow for the density of 110 guest room hotel that was approved by the City Planning Commission. Therefore, we, requ we request that the Plum Committee consider a zone change to the TQ C2-2 zone in lieu of the proposed TQ RAS 4-2 zone, along with the condition that a zoning administrator's adjustment for yards be obtained if the applicant seeks yards less than those otherwise required in the C2 zone. The TQ C2 zone is a corresponding zone within the Regional Center Commercial Land Use designation within the Wilshire Community Plan area, and therefore is consistent with the general plan. Notwithstanding the zone change correction, the project is unchanged from what was originally approved by CPC. In addition, the project has been fully, fully analyzed under the adopted environmental clearance case number ENV 2016-3065. Um, the proposed project is proposing to replace an existing surface lot. There will not be any displacement of residents or housing as a result of this. Koreatown is very hotel poor and we're very excited to bring new hotels into the area. The requested entitlements are those consistent with the typical um, uh, typical hotel use. We don't see any anything uh, you know, out of far left field here. So we please ask that the Plum Committee please adopt this change to the new C2-2 zone and uh, please adopt the conditions, the other conditions approved by CPC. The uh, C2-2 was originally proposed by the planning department, the report. Correct, yeah. I believe the that. CPC changed it. No, uh, I, think it, I think it was an oversight caught after uh, CPC. It was, it was an oversight. It wasn't that they, somehow there was a discussion and they changed no, it. No, it was okay. not discussed okay. at CPC. So it was a technical correction we need to make. Correct, and is I understand that, that is the appropriate under way of putting it? Yes, planning department? I'm sorry, what was the question? It's just a technical correction why we're changing the zoning, and it was an oversight that Correct. This at is the just CPC. A it's, not that, that, it's not that CPC had a discussion and they wished or intended to have a different zoning. There. Correct. No, okay. It was just right. Correct. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All right. Samir Santi, Natalie Schumann, and Daphne Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I spoke um, in opposition to this project at the March 9th hearing, that a planning commission hearing that um, Councilmember Wesson's uh, uh, official just uh, mentioned. As a resident of Koreatown, I'd like to express, I'd like to reiterate my concern regarding the over concentration of alcohol licenses in Koreatown. According to an LA Times article published in 2015, the Olympic area, 6.2 square miles, has more than 400 locations selling alcohol, the highest concentration in the city. This over-concentration of licenses has been linked to high crime rates by many sources, including a 2007 study by, by academics at Berkeley and an LA Times interview with District Attorney Mike Fuhrer. We do not need more alcohol licenses in Koreatown, we need more housing. At the very least, I believe a full environmental impact report is necessary to determine how another alcohol dispensing establishment will affect the community. Thank you. Thank you. Nellie Schumann. Here representing Unite Here Local 11, the Hospitality Workers Union of Los Angeles. We are deeply concerned that this developer is not committed to providing good jobs at this hotel once opened. The proposal includes no language around job training or local and diverse hiring, measures that are encouraged in the Wilshire Community Plan. If the developer is permitted to take away valuable land designated for housing, we believe the project should be obligated to give back in some way to the community. A commitment to good jobs and local hiring would be a step in the right direction. We request that a full EIR be completed for this project to determine the full impacts it would have on the community. Thank you. Thank you. Daphne Jacobs? Uh, she's not here. Not here? Thank okay. You. Okay. Any questions or comments on this? No? So we'll move to approve the report from CPC, draft ordinance, and adopt uh, the request from CD10 that it was a uh, technical change that needs to be made to change it to a TQC2-2 zoning. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Item number five. Item, oh. item five, Councilman, this is a planning commission 
report. It's a resolution and a general plan amendment and a, and a vesting zone change and a high district change for a mixed use project in CD10. Welcome, staff here on this item. Just a brief overview. Good afternoon, um, committee members. My name is Kanikia Gartner. I'm with the planning department, and I just want to provide a brief overview of the project. I'm located at 3525 8th Street and 765 South Serrano Avenue. The project is the construction, use, and maintenance of a new seven-story, 102-foot-tall mixed-use residential and commercial development above a three-level subterranean parking garage with an additional level of podium parking on the second floor. The development will consist of 364 dwelling units and 52,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. The project is situated within 0.2 miles of Wilshire Boulevard in Council District 10, and the development site also includes an ad area which spans north toward 7th, 7th Street. The applicant is requesting a general plan amendment to amend the Wilshire Community Plan to redesignate the project site from neighborhood office commercial to regional commercial land use, and also with the ad area, land use will be amended from high medium residential to res re regional commercial, a vesting zone change and height district change from QC2 and TQC2 zones to C2 and from height district number one to height district number two, with a flare area ratio limit of six to one, FAR in lieu of the otherwise allowed FAR 1.5 to 1, the removal of 15 foot building lines along the east side of Oxford Avenue and the west side of Serrano Avenue, conditional use for the off site sale of full alcohol, full line of alcohol, and site plan review for a project that exceeds 50 dwelling units and 50,000 square feet. The entitlements before you today are the general plan amendment, vesting zone change height district change, and building line removal. Per the City Planning Commission's recommendation for approval of the project on February 23rd, 2017, the Department of City Planning recommends approval of the general plan amendment, vesting zone change, height district change, and building line of removal for the project. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention. You. All right, Jordan Verokim. And then Edgar Kalashian. Council members Edgar Kalashian with Mayor Brown here on behalf of the applicant. I want to thank staff uh, for all of their, their hard work on this project. Uh, each of you should have a letter from me dated July 5, 2017 with uh, a little bit of handwritten redlining. Uh, we, 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 we do request a couple of changes to the conditions of approval. Uh, condition number 12, uh, to add some specific language. Condition number 18, uh, as the redlining denotes, we'd like to increase uh, the number of workforce housing units from 5% to 8% in lieu of the Planning Commission's 5% low income request. Uh, changes to condition 21, which remain consistent with the intent of the condition. Uh, with regard to condition number 34 on page two, we'd like to withdraw that request uh, and will maintain uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation for the uh, number of electrical vehicle parking spaces uh, and request to eliminate condition number uh, 36. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Jordan Barokim. Good afternoon, Jordan Brookeen with Council President Herb Wesson's office. We're here today to support the project and uh, we do uh, we ask the Plum Committee to go ahead and adopt the requested changes made uh, by the applicant. And again, just to reiterate, it's a uh, qualified conditions of approval number 12 relating to the ground level pedestrian access. Uh, Q condition number 18 relating to the affordable units. Uh, originally what was proposed was 5% uh, set aside for moderate income and 5% set aside for workforce. The applicant is proposing to increase the workforce from 5 to 8%, which is give, would give us a net gain of uh, 11 more uh, workforce housing units. Uh, Q condition number 21 as it relates to the facade treatment, as well as Q condition number 36. And as uh, mentioned by the applicant, the request for a change in condition number 34 has been uh, withdrawn. Uh, with that, we'd also like to add another condition. The applicant is also volunteering that 120 days prior 
to the leasing of the ground floor commercial or retail space that uh, that uh, the general public will be uh, solely outreach to uh, via the Chamber of Commerce and local paper real estate brokers in promoting retail business opportunities uh, to the local businesses. Uh, so again, it's, it's just a condition that gives first right of refusal to business owners within the community. And uh, we think that is a uh, very kind of, uh, or self, uh, very nice of the developer to impose that as a self condition. Thank you. Great, thank you. Did you submit your uh, other condition in writing, or is that just yeah. a, yeah. yeah. Is, I, uh, was I it believe submitted? it's already in the file, but I'm happy to submit okay. it. Okay, the clerk could get that, please. Thanks. Any questions or comments on this item? Not see none. Okay, we will uh, move to approve this item with changes submitted by the applicant as outlined in the letter with the withdrawal of their proposed amendment and item 34, correct? And with the proposed amendment by CD10 on the notice to local community stakeholders for the commercial space tenants. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Item seven. Item seven, Councilman, this is a, an appeal filed by, by Barbara Dawson, Bruce, and Lisa Garrett relative to the Building and Safety uh, Board of Commissioners approval of a haul route to export 8,150 cubic yards for the property at 9196 West Trasher Avenue in CD4. Okay, thank you. Is staff here to briefly present on this item? Yes, this is uh, Krikor from Building and Safety, Krikor Manukan from the Building and Safety Commission Board. If you could speak into the microphone, please, Sir. when you speak. Uh, Krikor Manukan from Building and Safety. Welcome. Can you yes. Just give us a brief overview of the project and the appeal. Uh, yes, this project was approved by the board. On June 20, it's for the haul route that received the categorical exemption. And um, we did add um, some extra conditions to mitigate certain traffic flow problems, uh, mainly outlined in C3 of the report. Uh, mainly that's uh, re to put a cap of uh, 24 vehicles entering the area. So um, if you have any questions, um, I'm available here to answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Julia Duncan from CD4, do you wish to speak now or after? No? Okay. Good afternoon, council members. The two appeals before you today are for the properties located at 9196 or 16 West Thrasher Avenue. Our office is intimately aware of the issues facing the Bird Street community, and we are actively working on addressing those issues. I've had the opportunity to take several tours with members of the community and have spoken directly with Ellen Evans, the newly appointed president of the Doheny Sunset Plaza Neighborhood Association. Traffic obstructions and enforcement are the part primary points of the appeal. The primary issues highlighted in the appeal and most uh, concern for the affected neighborhood are the obstructions that could be present in the public right-of-way, including but not limited to dumpsters and construction worker parking. Thorough and effective enforcement were, of also, were also of concern. We are proactively working with LADOT on long-term enforcement and have worked with, the street, with street services to identify several unpermitted dumpsters that are going to be removed from the public right-of-way. We've also created a first-of-its-kind haul route capping and tracking system for this community, which limits um, the number of haul route round trips to 24 days, 24 per day for the entire geographic area. And there's also a new link and website uh, on ladbs.org where the community can track those hauls. Uh, we feel this in conjunction with the newly adopted BHO and our current work to adopt the Hillside Construction Regulation Zone will have a significant positive impact. However, in order to address the issues that uh, were brought up in the appeal, we respectfully request that the appeal be granted in part and denied in part, and that condition 7C be amended to read, Staging for hauling vehicles is allowed on site only. Staging shall not interfere with traffic nor access to neighborhood driveways. Further, no parking of other construction vehicles nor construction bins for this project on the street along the uh, route during hauling hours. We feel this modified condition addresses the concerns of the appeal and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, so you're, basic, you're suggesting uh, a condition limiting staging operations near the site? Uh, require no parking of construction vehicles or bins? Correct. And, okay. Is 
Is that submitted in writing as well to the clerk? Uh, it's been submitted to the clerk and amended by the Board of Building and Safety Commissioner's Executive Secretary. She submitted that for the record as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two appellants. The first is Barbara Dawson. Is that correct? Yes. And the second is Bruce Garrett. Each of you have five minutes to present your case. Good afternoon. Thank you for hearing us. I'm going to speak to three topics that are paramount importance, as we believe, to um, all that's going on in the Bird Streets. While there's many, I'm just going to highlight three topics today with regards to 9196. I want to first say the illustration to my left here is an illustration of all of the sites that are under construction in the Bird Streets. This is just the Bird Streets, and you'll see the white dot by the two homes or two lots in question. The first concern is the destruction and the surfacing of our roads. The roads and the bird streets are treacherous. They're not being repaired. No developer is taking any responsibility in repairing any of the roads. In fact, you can drive the bird streets and you will not see where... One second. I, I apologize for interrupting you. I've been corrected that there's only one appeal. I thought there were two appeals. There's only one appeal, so you have a total of five minutes, okay. not five minutes each. Okay. You could Thank you. Yes. It's, sorry, and it's, it's in our mind that some responsibility and accountability needs to go to developers. Currently, if you drove the Bird Streets, I can only cite one site that was just recently completed on the same road on Thrasher Avenue that the developer did pave in front of that home and, in fact, in front of a couple other homes. If you drive the entire Bird Street area, you won't see that in any other place. Our streets are falling apart. Thrasher Avenue, the one with 9196, it's nearly a one-lane road. It was very, very treacherous to go down that road, and I'll show you as a few pictures. If you can hold this one. The first picture to the right, you'll see how narrow the road is. You'll see where cars are being forced into the, actually into the landscape because there's no asphalt left. That's how you're forced to drive on that road. The other thing is when any cement truck, haul truck, any, any truck of any size goes down that road for this haul route and for any construction, that, that truck will be backing down the road because there's no way to turn around. Next, you'll notice there's um, a trailer on the road. Those trailers are dangerous. They're taking up space. It's not just on Thrasher. It's all through the hills. Um, the other thing we would say is when those trucks are backing down, there's a site right there that's next to my home. I leave early in the morning to go to work, and there's been many times I get to almost the top of Thrasher, I'm met by a cement truck that I have to move quickly and swiftly to the left into someone's driveway, and luckily I'm at that point so I can get out of the way so I'm not hit by the truck. They don't see you, they just keep coming. The other thing I just want to point out is um, some of the safety concerns you'll notice in the picture. This is a truck parked on Duhini. It's coming down Duhini, no driver. You'll notice that everyone has to, I have to wait to go around the truck because they're in the lane going up the hill. You also see a truck backing down Sunset Plaza, backing down on the wrong side of the road into Belfast. You'll see another truck parked, a trailer is parked at the top of Thrasher on the drive out side of the road. You have to go to the left to drive out. You can't see around the hedges because a car could come around that corner and hit you at any moment. And then the final illustration of safety in our neighborhood is a truck at the bottom of this hill. I had to back up as far as I could. I couldn't go much further because there were cars behind me. I had nowhere else to go. He had to be able to make the turn to get onto the road. It's just treacherous. It's treacherous. It's very hazardous. And we just hope that some way, somehow, you can get your city, groups, municipalities, all the um, departments to work together. It might be a funding thing. You may not have the dollars to have more people up there to enforce the violations, the illegal parking, et cetera. However, I got to believe if you had someone up there for just a week, you'd more than pay for half of their salary, all their salaries. It's just a disaster. And then finally, I just want to mention the hillside destruction. If you take a look 
at this illustration, you're going to see a house in Oriole. You'll see the house on Thrasher, and you'll see a home on Thrasher that's just been completed. Sorry, I don't have these numbers committed to memory. 9161 was approved for 11,500 cubic yards of dirt to be hauled. 9199 is finished and on the market, and that was 3,800 cubic yards that was hauled away. The house in question is 9196, 8,150 cubic yards. And we're just wondering if there's any studies that take a look at hillside stability. So I just would hope that you would consider the hillside stability in, in your review. This, 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 this could become tumbling down. You know what happened in the fall last year with all the rains and what happened over in Laurel Canyon. Unfortunately, we think the same thing could happen on Thrasher. The other thing I'd ask again to summarize is that our streets get repaired and we have some accountability for the safety on our neighborhood. Bruce? Time is up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ashrag Hemati, the applicant. Hello. My name is Ashraf Hemati. I am the applicant for the project that they are talking about. And I was applicant a process of permit for 9199 trasher also then they finished successfully construction I know this project if you go to a website of mm, LADBS you can see what is the process of this project this owner that always from eight years nine years that I'm working with this project they are arguing for all other people's construction they start for example, uh, the project that I'm talking about, 9141 Trasher, that one of the Afil person, they start their project from 2007 and they finished 2016. They are using service of building and safety, but they don't care about all other people that's working in that area. And other person, the other project that I'm talking, it is they start 2003, and they still their work. They finished 7 11 2017. It means more than 28. One of them is 28 application. Another is 20 application. They finish their jobs, and right now they are talking about all other neighbors. They are, these people that they are talking, they are not owner. Owner hired these people only as a lawyer. They are talking, but really. I am architect from my country. I, we are hardworking people. I, we have many projects. We didn't do anything wrong against the code. And when they are talking about uh, riffraff form and the rest of the history, I was in Van Nuys, I was in West LA and, and downtown. These are the results of the the best of the street is 20 feet. And always they are talking, of, oh, we measured that one. It's not mm, professional. So mm, I am really happy with the city, with all this. I am working from 2000 until now with the city. So they are working hard, and they are honest people, I said. And they want to protect all the people in that area. So, and we are trying our best. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go to public comment on this item. Each public speaker has one minute. Robin Greenberg, Robert Schleisinger, Gary Silvers. have a uh, what's that called a um, you're supposed to file something that will allow you to have five minutes instead of yeah mr. chair there is no community impact statement on file for these you're projects. supposed to have a community impact statement to have uh, five minutes otherwise you could come up and speaking and, and have your one minute okay so I apologize I just want to be consistent with the rules thank you Okay. So 
apologies. Robin Greenberg. Hello, my name is Robin Greenberg. I'm president of the Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council, and I thank you very much for allowing us to come to speak today. The Beverly Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council Planning and Land Use Committee supports the Doheny Sunset Plaza Neighborhood Association's appeal regarding the Hall Routes 9196 and 9016 West Thrasher. 9196 Thrasher is less than 20 feet wide and an unimproved substandard street. 9196 is a dead-end cul-de-sac, too narrow for the practical use of a fire truck or other emergency vehicles, which would have to back out until they reach 9016. Traffic obstructions and enforcement are the basis of this appeal, and therefore the issuance of these haul routes are inappropriate. Thank you. Robert Schlesinger. Based on the failure of the city to clear the, uh, these obstructions and the lack of enforcement, there is substantial evidence that a project or projects may, may have one or more significant effects on the cumulative, on the environment, the health and safety and welfare of residents and the grading the, and ignoring CEQA guidelines that clearly address cumulative impact in this hillside. I'm going to skip the part of um, of CEQA that everybody else can read and I'll go right to the bottom for the one minute. <clears throat> when assessing whether a cumulative effect requires an EIR, the lead agency shall consider whether the cumulative impact is significant and whether the effects of the project are cumulatively considerable. An EIR must be prepared if the cumulative impact may be significant and the project's incremental effect through Individually, though individually limited, is cumulative, cumulatively considerable. Thank you. Gary Silvers, Stella Jiang, Stella Gray. Hello, my name is Gary Silvers. I live at 1477 Blue Jay Way, which is around the corner from this project. Uh, the hall route that uh, Building Safety approved for this project to go all the way around and down Thrasher to Sunset Plaza is ridiculous. We got 30,000 yards of dirt already going down that part of Thrasher and uh, you have refused to take the parking off the street so it's actually a one-way street and uh, it's I think there's 14 projects being built within a half a mile of this area and there's six of them with using these haul routes right now and uh, I ask that at least if you have approve this project, which I don't think it should be approved. It should go down Doheny and not down all the way around down Thrasher. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stella Jong, and I am a Doheny Bird Streets resident. What is a human life worth? In Beverly Hills, it has been deemed to be worth $32.5 million. Detectives Ernest Allen and Officer Nicholas Lee were killed by construction vehicles on two separate occasions on the same dangerous hillside road. This area is adjacent to ours. Our hillside has many of the same characteristics with even more windier, more treacherous streets and more ridge lines. While no one can ever place a dollar value on a human life, it's something that should be considered when determining whether to approve haul routes in a community whose safety has been put at risk because of the surge of construction, which has been unprecedented. Consider this, it's only a matter of time before someone, a resident, city employee, construction worker, or child, gets seriously hurt. The same questions will be posed to you. Was the city aware of the potential dangers and what did they do to mitigate the risks? Thank you very much. Stella Gray, Ellen Evans, Jim Murray. Hello, gentlemen. My name is Stella Gray, and I live three blocks south of 9196 Thrasher. 9100 block of Thrasher Way was erroneously listed as having a, a standard street um, 
designation in the Department of Building and Safety preliminary referral form that is attached here. In addition, that form incorrectly states that the street is at least 20 feet wide from the driveway of the lot to the boundary of the hillside area, which is Sunset Boulevard in this case. It is not. We, uh, we took street measurements and identified areas along the block that are 16 to 19 and a half feet wide from curb to curb. The designation as standard or substandard street have many consequences, including requirements and allowances for grading, setbacks, street access, and dedication requirements for public use to improve the street. An extreme amount of 8,000 plus cubic yards should never be allowed to haul from this property, and we put the city on notice about possible consequences to public safety as a result of excessive non-compliant grading. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ellen Evans, and I am president of the newly created Doheny Sunset Plaza Neighborhood Association. We represent the area north of Sunset between Laurel Canyon and Beverly Hills. We're just a few months old, and already we have nearly 80 dues-paying members and communicate with a mailing list of almost 350 people. Um, we recently surveyed neighbors on their concerns in construction and trucks were at the top of the list, even higher than party houses, which really says something about what's going on here. Um, we're well into a serious building boom in our area, and we anticipate that it will continue for the foreseeable future. We have housing stock that is ripe for renewal, and this is a process we recognize as necessary. Thus far, though, the city has failed to do its job in maintaining order and safety in our neighborhood. The city of Beverly Hills was recently hit with a substantial settlement for accidents that occurred on Loma Vista. Given the frequency with which we've warned about dangerous conditions and failure to follow rules, one would think that our city is opening itself up to greater risk. Please deny the hall routes and evaluate the situation, figuring out a reasonable and safe way to proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Murray, Stephanie Savage. James Costa. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Murray. Um, if there's ever a fire in this area in the daytime, there will be casualties. People will be trapped and they will not be able to evacuate. And I will yield the balance of my time for you to think about this seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Savage, Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. I support the appeal. Um, the Hillside Referral Form for 9196 Thresher Way I've included has incorrect information on it. The road is less than 20 feet wide in multiple locations and does not have a continuous curb. All Hillside Referral Forms include page two, where guidelines are given to the applicant in the event that road conditions differ from the referral form. The Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council has reviewed many projects in the Bird Street neighborhood and have found several errors in the Hillside Referral Forms. They're found online. Many roads are deemed uh, standard by old engineering vault drawings that are incorrect. Uh, field measurements prove otherwise. We have communicated this issue to uh, Council Office 4 and to the Bureau of Engineering. Bureau of Engineering uh, is in the process of validating street widths with the basic investigation. We have asked BOE to add Thresh away to our list of bird streets uh, to, to measure. Um, due to the multiple locations of substandard width on Thresher, it should be easily determined that the road is substandard. This uh, ignoring the street width via a CE eliminates the opportunity for a planning case to happen, street dedication to be missed, the opportunity to need road widening and improvement is missed, and considerations for reduced grading on some street are also missed. I have more information here. I'll give you copies. Okay. Thank you. James Costa, Allison Taylor. So I'm, I'm James Cost. I live right across the street from where this is going to be happening, so I'll be mostly affected by this. Um, just some of the, the things that have been going on. When Eric was there, when 9199 was being built, he complained about the haul trucks going down and, and the drama that went through. Every day we had to deal with trucks uh, blocking the way. He couldn't get out of his driveway. I couldn't get out of my driveway. Food trucks coming down the street. It is dangerous. When they, when they started drilling in 91, 99, my house started to shake. I immediately called them. So there's a, if you're going to start tearing down um, 91, 96, and the house above them is also doing work, that is a possibility for me, a landslide, and I will be mostly affected by this. I understand people have to get things done, and you know houses have to be built, 
but 24 trucks is way too many in a day. That street is a narrow street and it's dangerous. And I invite anyone to come visit the street, see what it's like, and try parking there or try living there for one day with trucks coming up and down the street. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Alison Taylor. When assessing whether a cumulative effect requires an EIR, EIR, the lead agency shall consider whether the cumulative effect impact is significant and whether the effects of the project are cumulatively, oh my God, can't say it, cumulatively considerable. An EIR must be prepared if the cumulative impact may be significant and the project's incremental effect, though individually limited, is cumulatively considerable. The area surrounding these properties is overbuilt to such a degree that it violates the intent of the baseline hillside ordinance, which is to protect the Santa Monica Mountains and accordingly with the fact that dust, traffic, heavy equipment and direct physical changes in the environment requires a determination that the overall environmental change is so substantial that anything further requires an EIR. Cumulatively considerable means that the incremental effects of an individual project or projects are significant when viewed in connection with the effects of past, current, and future projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. So can staff come back up, please, for some questions? So just to clarify, on this project, how many trucks per day will be going through the street? 24. 24 per day. Um, how often do we know? Can we calculate that? Do we know that? We don't know that. They haven't scheduled. Um, they would have to call in if uh, item C C3 in the report. Okay. Sure. Um, I just if you could there. identify again uh, yourself. Julia again. Duncan, Council Member David Rue's office. This project is not authorized for 24 haul route trips a day. Because of the... Uh, large number of projects that were occurring in this area. We had a project that came to you, I don't know if you remember, several months back, it was a haul route that was denied. Because of that, we proactively worked with the Department of Building and Safety and the Grading Department to come up with a capping system. It caps the total number of haul route round trips to 24 a day for the entire geographic area. Okay. Not for this particular project. It requires the applicant to call the Department of Building and Safety the Monday before they haul and reserve their schedule for the week. Once they, it's a first come, first serve basis. Once any number of projects get to the cumulative 24, it's cut off and you have to wait. So without, so that 24 cap is in place now? It's in place now and it's been in place for about since December. So, so even if project, we add this project, there's still going to be the cap of 24. For the entire geographic area. For the for entire geographic So it's not going to add any more trucks. Correct. Okay. Well, that's what I was getting at because, so I understood it, if this was 24 total just for this project, that would be a little too much per day. Nobody um, else is hauling, then yes, they will get all 24. Okay, so this project is not going to add any more additional trucks because of the cap that's in place. Okay. Correct. All right. And so my other question is enforcement. Um, you know, basic enforcement, you call park enforcement today, <laughs> it takes a while for, some, for them to go out there sometimes. Who enforces this? And how do we ensure that this is enforced? Who enforces the 24 cap? The 24 cap would have to be logged by a grading inspector. They have to hire a deputy grading inspector on site to log the number of trips. They so there's someone hired by the applicant to record? Who, who, um, for CD4, who, who ensures that there's a 24 cap on regionally? Who, who enforces that? One of the specific conditions of approval is that the Monday before they contact Cora Johnson, the actual haul route inspector is Grant Woods. That number and his email are also available on the website. Okay. So there's right, an so Grant inspector Woods there. is the inspector, but they register and reserve their spot with Cora Johnson, the board secretary. Okay. Sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, with that, let me suggest that... Um, the issues raised here on environmental grounds um, don't appear to raise to the level of a fair argument for CEQA purposes, uh, but at the same time, there are some issues raised with um, the traffic uh, uh, safety issues imposed by this. However, uh, this project, is, as, as expressed uh, by CD4, does not increase the number of routes. Uh, that's already in place, whether this project goes in or not, or the routes um, uh, uh, or these haul route is approved. Uh, I've seen a number of projects come through here in that area that we've 
we're very concerned about the number of trucks that have been traveling uh, for uh, haul routes there. And so with a cap, I think that helps alleviate that. But the issue is enforcement. So we've been assured that the enforcement will be in place. Um, so with that, let's uh, I move that we deny the appeal and sustain the decision of the Building and Safety Commission. And we um, incorporate the uh, conditions set forth by CD4, which includes staging for hauling vehicles is allowed on site only. Staging shall not interfere with traffic nor access to neighboring driveways. Further, no parking of other construction vehicles nor construction bins for this project on the street along the route during hauling hours. So, any objections to that? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Next item, I believe, is item eight. Yes, to be here. Uh, Councilman, item eight is an appeal by Barbara Dawson, Bruce, and Lisa Garrett. Uh, again, relates to a building and safety commissioner's approval of a haul route to export 5,400 cubic yards of earth from the property at 9016 West Trasher Avenue in CD4. Welcome. Hi, Dean Okinawi, Board of uh, Building and Safety Commission. Uh, they've heard this case on June 20, 2017, and approved the haul route and accepted the categorical exemption. Again, this is in the Bird Streets, and all of the Bird Street conditions, including the 24 cap, uh, are included in this uh, application. Um, also to note that for 9016 Thrasher, uh, the streets are not as narrow as for the previous one that we looked at. Um, it goes um, a minimum of 30 feet going on to uh, the main road on, um, sorry, one second. So going on to Rising Glen. Um, and so this one doesn't have as many issues as the other one. And then also in the specific conditions, it says only one hauling truck is allowed along the route at any given time. And uh, adjacent to the project site, there will be no parking signs posted. And if you have any questions regarding any other specific conditions for this, uh, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Duncan from CD4. Good afternoon, um, Julia Duncan, Council Member Rue's office. We would be making the same request for the change in conditions uh, 7C to be amended to read, staging for hauling vehicles is allowed on site only. Staging shall not interfere with traffic nor access to neighborhood driveways. Further, no parking of other construction vehicles nor construction bins for this project on the street along the route during haul hours. Um, as a side note, I do want to say we are working with LAFD to possibly red curb one of the sides of the street to prevent parking. And uh, earlier this morning, Frank Bush and Pascal Chalita sent individual emails to the appellants here today, letting them know that inspectors were on site today at the um, currently operating haul routes to continue to address these issues. Okay. And this is under the 24 cap as well? Yes. Okay. Barbara Dawson and Bruce Garrett, the appellants, five minutes. Council members, Bruce Garrett, 1457 Blue Jay Way, so pretty much a neighbour of this subject property. Look, I, at the end of the day, I want to encapsulate or summarise what we're talking about here today in, in the context of the issues, and then put myself in your position and the issues both from a benefit as well as the challenges that you're going to face. So first of all, as we've encapsulated, the number and frequency of haul and cement trucks on current and future development sites in the Bird Streets is chaotic and potentially dangerous. At present, there are bylaws that do not deter developers from breaches because at the end of the day, the upside profit is so significant. So a fine, a slap on the wrist means nothing. The quantity of parking and carelessness of tradesmen parking on these streets is being completely abused. So I think you're getting a trend here of increasing enforcement resources and officers and compliance. The destruction of the surface quality and state of disrepair of the streets, it's, it's an embarrassment. You go to Truesdale, it's been completely resurfaced over the last several years. Some of the bird streets are looking third world. It's an embarrassment to the LA city.
let's overlay additional obstacles, office trailers, food trucks and dangerous speeds of traffic through the streets used as a cut through also uh, add to the further congestion. Safety issues with regard to restricted access of emergency vehicles, that is a critical issue. In high temperatures in summer, there is no way a fire truck could get out there during business hours. And also, if anyone is at a health concern, even an ambulance would find it difficult to get up there. Office trailers and dumpsters, again, these are further obstacles, so effectively they permanently create two lanes into one through the period of congestion. And the office trailers are there outside the project for at least two to three years consecutively. Increased noise, air pollution and local commuting time. I mean, again, we're talking about further congestion and danger as a result of the increased approval of the projects. So to put myself in your position, the benefits and risks for the city. So you can, let's, you know, our, our taxpayer money is going somewhere. We'd like it spent wisely. So let's increase regulations, fees and enforcement. The city would benefit from an increase in revenue from raising all types of permit fees. So approve the developers, but raise money, levies and associated penalties. So if they breach the conditions, increase the fines that they're going to be hit and that's increasing revenue to the city. These would more than offset an increase in enforcement resourcing by employing more inspectors and officers. So increase civil servants, increase the number of officers and inspectors that are going to enforce the conditions that you're imposing. And that would get good publicity. So you would serve, you would get good publicity in the LA Times and other publications. The downside risks. Liability and litigation risk, I mean, that's an absolute no-brainer. The increased density without heavy regulation and enforcement of haul trucks, let's add in their cement trucks, because once the haul trucks are finished, then the cement trucks come in. Obstacles and other vehicles is moving this congested area closer to a tragic accident. As already been mentioned by one of my colleagues, this has already been seen in Truesdale, where tragically we've had three deaths, two of them policemen, and this would expose the city to significant lit litigation risk and, as you would expect, negative publicity. I'll hand over to Barbara. Thank you, Bruce. Barbara Dawson, 9141 Thrasher. I just want to take two seconds to show you a recent haul route. With respect to only managing so many trucks coming up into the hills, this is two weeks ago. You can see, Bruce, can hold this. You can see, you can see the congestion here the guy's got, he has no idea what to do at this point because there was no flagman at Rising Glen. There was no flagman at the Blue Jay Way. There's only one at the corner of Brasher and Tanager. That's one house away from 90s, uh, the house in question right now. He didn't know what to do. It took me 35 minutes to get from my house to down to Sunset Plaza where I work. You can see the congestion. You can see the truck coming up. That truck never should have come up. That It's blocked. And so that continues to be an issue. This, on any given day, is a corner of Thrasher and Tanager Way. Illegal parking here, here, you can't get through. I just beg for enforcement. You have to have some people up there enforce. It's got to happen. It's not happening. And I know they're having someone monitor how many trucks come up. Just, for, just a quick FYI, the house next to us excavated much more dirt than they were supposed to. They brag about it. Thank you. Suppose it's a really nice little badge they have. Lawrence Rose, the applicant. Hello, everyone. I'm the um, owner of the property that's up right now. I've lived in the neighborhood for about 25 years. I've seen a lot of changes. As a homeowner, I experience all the kind of stuff that you would expect anyone to experience, all the trucks and all the noise and everything else. So I'm pretty familiar with the situation. I can tell you that it, there's so many exaggerated and half-truth claims here that I'll just try and address a few. It's never taken me 35 minutes to get to work. I go to work every day, all different times between 9 and 11, varying never it's 30 minutes, not anything near that. Once in a while, yes, it's not as quickly moving as I'd like. I, sometimes I've turned around and gone the other way, very rarely. 
um, 30 minutes. Um, by the way, I'm not saying it hasn't happened. This is not a regular occurrence. This is an, uh, a, perhaps a one-time thing. Um, you've heard there were dangerous, treacherous, and so forth and so on. Look, these, these, these conditions aren't perfect. People are building houses. No, uh, as I said, I suffer as much as, as the rest of the people. But, but, but it's the story you're hearing is, let me say, slightly exaggerated. Um, we've heard th uh, talk about environment being ruined. Well, nobody's come up here and given any evidence about the environment. If they come up here and they put a report out and they want to talk about the environment, fine. But just to say that the environment is being degraded isn't any evidence or anything. Have them go do a report. Let me quickly talk about the two associations here. I never heard of these associations. They've not reached out to me. I've not gotten an email. I've not gotten a letter. And I'm living in the heart of the whole thing. I don't know who they are. All my stuff is public. All you know, our records are public. Why haven't they reached out to me? Why haven't they said, "Here's how we can make it better"? We'd like you. Would you guys mind doing this? You guys being the people who are coming up in the building. No one has reached out. So it's great to come up here and say, "We're representing whatever." Nobody I know knows who these people are. I'm not saying they're not representing somebody, but if they're representing, they should be talking to us and trying to work things out in, in the best way for everybody. Um, I think that's mostly it. I think, I think um, um, the roads are uh, in need of repair, but the roads are in need of repair throughout the city. And I can tell you some areas, again, I've been there 25 years, there's some corners where roots have pushed up uh, like almost a foot and a half, two feet that have been there long before the, the level of construction of the last few years. So to blame the bad roads on the construction is, again, an exaggeration. Is there a little bit more wear and tear? Yeah, there probably is, and it probably does need to be repaved. Um, in, in, in fairness, I would support a number of things that were said about the fines, about uh, absolutely more fines, more enforcement. Absolutely. This could help everybody. It would help me as a homeowner. Are, th are there people illegally parked out there? Yeah. Should the contractors be fined? Yeah, they should be. Um, the thing that I heard from the city person that I think is the best thing possible and better than anything you've heard from any of these people, and I, I don't mean to sound, can you hold on a second? I can't hear myself thinking. Oh, one second. Um, hold this time, please. Uh, the person with a puppet, can you not disrupt the speakers? This will be your first warning. On your second warning, we will ask you to leave this meeting. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, With all due respect to these people who have who are frustrated, and I, I join a lot of their frustrations, danger, treachery, life, lives lost, and so forth and so on. The thing that was said over here was more important than anything that they said. And I say this as a 25-year resident. Construction or no construction, these should be one parking-sided streets. It would solve 95% of the, all the construction congestion not 100% because it's construction. Some trucks have to go up there. But, but what, what the city ought to do if they want to do anything about this problem that's more effective than anything I've heard said, if, if anything was said constructively, uh, a little bit was, um, it, it is make these all one-way uh, one parking. The problem is when you have two-way parking on both sides, and sometimes dumpsters and sometimes thicker trucks. You've got a, a 10 cars long. You've got one car going down the middle, five cars in. Another c guy going at the other side, five cars in. And what do you do? It's just so simple. I mean, just stop the two, the two sided parking. That will solve 95% of these problems. Not 100%, but, but all the congestion that everybody is upset about will be solved well, virtually all. Um, so that, the redlining or whatever, call it, that that's really what I would encourage as, as a longtime neighborhood person who's observed all this stuff. Um, I said at the last meeting that, you know, we ought to give out our numbers and anyone has a complaint, call us and we'll, we'll take care of it. I mean, we would pledge, I would pledge as a homeowner, they got a problem with a dumpster or with Coca-Cola cans. I've had all of it in front of my house and I talk to the people and... and, and we ought to have an open door policy, and I'll give out my number. They can talk to me if they have a problem. Final thing, I understand that, that, that there are some Pe new regulations, two or three months old, with the trucks. Let's give them a chance and see if they Thank work. You. I mean, how are we going to know if they work? They just got implemented. Thank you. Robin Greenberg, Robert Schleisinger, Alan Evans.
My name is Robin Greenberg. I'm president of the Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council, and we're here today to support the Homeowners Association of the Doheny Sunset Plaza Neighborhood Association and their appeal regarding the Hall route at 9196 and 9016 West Thrasher. The residents are not against construction but the cumulative impact of the number of projects currently in this area, coupled with the fact that there are only two ways out of the neighborhood, Doheny Drive and Rising Glen, the cumulative impact of construction trucks is overwhelming. And the public health, welfare, and safety of the community is unacceptable at the moment. Over the past couple of years, some of the residents have experienced breathing problems and some of their children have been to doctors with respiratory issues. When assessing whether a cumulative effect requires an EIR, the lead agency should consider whether the cumulative effect is significant. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Schlesinger, Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. The area surround, um, sorry, therefore an EIR is suggested due to the direct and indirect impact caused by the city's failure to address the above mentioned issues. Before an agency can require an EIR, they have to make the determination when, the assessing, whether, when assessing whether a cumulative effect requires an EIR, the lead agency should consider whether uh, the cumulative impact is significant and whether the effects of the project are cumulatively considerable. An EIR must be prepared if the cumulative impact may be significant and the project's incremental effect, though individually limited, is cumulatively limited. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Ellen Evans, Tim Vincent, Gary Silvers, and Stella Gray. The rights of developers have taken precedence over the rights of neighborhood residents for too long. We have substantial commercial-sized developments going on throughout our neighborhood. People who come by are shocked by what they see. No haul routes in our area should be approved until the dangerous situations that have been highlighted, not just in these appeals, but also in numerous remarks at meetings of the Board of Building and Safety are solved and until a realistic mechanism for enforcement is in place. For this, we need resources. Self-enforcement is not only burdensome, it is also dangerous and minimally effective. It is not the neighbor's responsibility to figure out who to call to get a dumpster removed when that dumpster is significantly narrowing a haul route road, especially when those drum traps are, dump trucks are working for a profit that doesn't accrue to us. It's, it, it takes a ton of time. In addition, neighbors who try to affect change are often verbally or physically harassed. Setting aside the other many important issues regarding construction in our neighborhood, at minimum, it's the city's responsibility to make sure these routes are clear and navigable, that emergency vehicles can get through, and that traffic rules are being followed. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Vincent, Gary Silvers, and Stella Gray. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the, the efforts that have been for, put forth with the city council. Um, I think that the, the restrictions that have been set forth um, the last couple months are still, we're still going to see the trickle effect of that, um, the reduction in the cumulative effect. Uh, in addition, this year, that BHO, um, the, the code was revised to reduce the size of homes and reduce the grading. And I think both of these, these things together are going to help reduce the con congestion in the neighborhood. Um, and I, also like to say that the the um, that the haul route specific items um, being limited to 24 trucks a day is going to go a long ways to, to relieving the congestion in in the neighborhood. Thank you, Gary Silvers. Hello, my name is Gary Silvers. I live uh, with uh, 100 yards from this project. Uh, there's a project building safety approved the house right next door to haul 8,000 feet also. I mean, it is absolutely uh, 
we think this ridge is going to fall down with all this construction. Also, the building calls for 28 feet. We have a 16-foot height limit for our CCNR, so the house is grossly out of compliance with uh, our CCNRs. It'll block uh, the views. The value of the houses up there are based on the views, and it'll definitely reduce the values of the houses up above that will be blocked by this house, and we hope that you refuse to uh, let this project go forward. Thank you. Stella Gray, Stella Jiang, Jim Murray, and Stephanie Savage. Hello, I'm Stella Gray. I'm a neighbor nearby. You already saw this picture, these photos of congestion on our streets. What I want to emphasize, thank you, Barbara. Uh, what I want to emphasize that I think that commission is missing a point. It is not about 24 haul trucks. It is about unsafe driving of these haul trucks through the streets. It's about uh, haul trucks and other uh, construction-related traffic blocking streets, turning them in sometimes one lane streets, even the widest streets, and ambulances, any emergency vehicles, street, city vehicles cannot get to what they, where they need to get. So I think that the point, uh, the, the, you cannot rest uh, uh, assured that, uh, you know, 24 vehicles, uh, 24 uh, cap will uh, resolve the problem. I think the problem is still there. And until we delay, until we take a breath, we delay uh, the process, we deny this uh, whole route and decide what, how meaningfully we can enforce current rules, we cannot have safe lives. And I think that that's the key and not the 24 cap. Thank, Thank you. you. Stella Jiang. Hello, I'm the other Stella. Um, don't be fooled into thinking that these developers are going to comply with these conditions. Without uh, enforcement, these conditions mean nothing. And what is enforcement? What is it to you? Is it having uh, the police come by regularly to um, police the uh, traffic violations? Uh, is it having a haul route monitor there? Well, the haul route monitor doesn't show up in most of these violations uh, until later because most of these violations occur in the early morning hours. So what that means is that we have to self-police. And when we self-police, we have to stop while we're driving, take a picture of the violation, and then we have to stop from where we're going and forward these emails to various people within the city agencies. And then it isn't until the afternoon that we get a response back that says we sent somebody out, but they saw no violations. So therefore, our photos do not act as any sort of evidence of any violation. It has to be a proof of some city agency officer to, um, to, to notate the violation. And so therefore, there are no consequences. And we ask that the you enforce and put some funding into enforcement so that we can be safer. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Murray, Stephanie Savage, Allison Taylor. Jim Murray, at the very least, please do not allow 10-wheel dump trucks to be up in this area. <coughs> this builder could very well use six eight-wheel dump trucks. It is the size of all of these vehicles that is presenting all of the problems. What works on typical city streets simply does not, you cannot transfer it into the hillsides. It just magnifies everything out of proportion. Sorry about that. So I would hope that you would consider uh, that this project use um, at least six to eight wheel trucks instead of the ten wheelers. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Savage, Allison Taylor. I just found some stuff online about the guidelines for um, haul routes and the good neighbor construction practices. The, if someone violates any of these items, all they have to do is call 311, but that's sometimes very difficult to get anyone to respond quickly, and um, uh, any complaints aren't followed up by code enforcement or whoever until much later. Um, so that, you know, when people take dirt out of the earth, it uh, fluffs up because it's hard rock. What they're calculating in the, the haul route amounts, the totals, 
13,550, that equates to over 16,000 in terms of volume that's taken out because you have to multiply the volume of actual hard rock dirt in the earth by 1.25, so it equates to that many more trucks out there. So it's a little bit uh, misrepresentational <laughs> to just say it's the hard rock. You have to add that much more, so the impact is 25% greater than we're talking about right now. I've just, I'll give you these copies so you can look them over. Allison Taylor. Projects should be denied because the city cannot manage the construction cycle of projects already underway. Daily, there are violations from workers not abiding by construction hours to dangerously oversized vehicles impeding traffic to things as crazy as haul trucks towing graders. The house next door to me was under construction for five and a half years. The house behind me was for two and a half. The owner didn't like it, so now he has demolished it and is apparently building a four-story with an elevator for cars. Believe me, the noise, manipulations, toxins, and stress for over six years have certainly taken a daily impact on my health and well-being. This project needs a serious environmental review and consideration of the effect of the cumulative impact of projects already underway. Please do not approve this project without that vital assessment. It's a very dangerous neighborhood to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that concludes public comment. Um, can I ask um, CD4 a question or staff either way? Um, are there any particular intersections that have um, a lot of traffic with respect to these trucks? So for example, the 24 cap is for an area, but is there additional activity in any particular street? Be able to name an intersection, but Rising Glen and Doheny are the two main thoroughfares through which uh, the haul trucks are regulated to. So they can either exit one or the other, and usually it's the proximity to those exits. What we've done in other instances is uh, add additional flag people um, when there's additional trucks crisscrossing in any particular street or intersection. Is that necessary here in any particular area with the addition of, well, we're going to have a 24 cap. I don't know if it's going to have much of an increased impact just given the cap, but is there additional traffic in any particular area? If there was an intersection that the community had requested, uh, it didn't come up during the whole route hearing for additional flagmen. Okay, so that, that wasn't raised at all in any particular intersection or street? Um, currently we just have them on Thrasher and Tanager and Thrasher and Rising Glen, and those are the main intersections which this route goes through. Okay, and again, um, in terms of enforcement, we depend on the monitor, and is that adequate? Um, we have the um, deputy inspector on site that's hired by the applicant, and then we have the grading inspector that comes and checks the logs. Also, the logs are then sent to Cora Johnson, uh, board secretary. Um, and then if there's any issues, uh, we've had one issue, and uh, the neighbors called us, and we called the grading inspector, and he went out there and cited the property. And so we do have enforcement, and if they do call our office, we try to act on it as soon as possible. I would like to add, um, we have, we've been working uh, with Senior Inspector Karen Bowie of Street Services to uh, remove the unpermitted dumpsters in the right-of-way. There are currently approximately nine unpermitted dumpsters in the right-of-way that we're actively working on removing. Okay, good. Well, thank you. I, and, you know, you do want to... Um, agree with some of the concerns raised by the local residents uh, in that nobody would want to see these trucks pass by your house. Um, the hall routes are intended to have this public process to have conditions placed upon a, an approved project so that uh, we can monitor and mitigate any impacts. Uh, here I've seen that uh, it's a creative way of, of managing what is some consider cumulative impacts. Uh, we've seen some other areas of the city where they haven't gotten as creative as this area to create cap a cap, and so I think that's a very good approach uh, to do it. I would suggest to the local residents, if you do see any uh, additional m impacts or additional mitigations that need to take place, to please speak with your local council member, council member Ryu and CD4, um, and. Uh, and to see if any of those could be amended uh, through this procedure. Um, so with that, uh, any other questions or comments? Um, we'll move then to 
deny the appeal and approve the sustain the decision of the bill board and building and uh, board of building and safety commission and incorporate the amendments or conditions proposed by CD4 which include staging for hauling vehicles is allowed on site only staging shall not interfere with traffic nor access to neighboring driveways further no parking of other construction vehicles or construction bins for this project on the street along the route during hauling hours I think that's it correct uh, yes okay it's, I think condition C7 it's in condition C7 okay any objections seeing none so ordered thank you we have one more item on the agenda today. It's public comment. Our first speaker is Herman. So you heard it. Communities protesting about these large capacity vehicles disrupting the flow of their neighborhoods. But these plum fuckers don't care about your neighborhoods. Their only interest is in development. The same gentrification development that hogs up our local streets when you paint off all the curbs and the disabled, those under the Affordable Housing Act and those under the so-called preliminaries of what is considered our justification. Oh, that's a good camera there, bro. Yeah, you do a good job of filming there, Dawson. That's the only goddamn thing you do good besides sitting there on your ass. Get involved, folks. Get involved. If you don't have nothing to say, how can you politically correct the issues involving our community? Now, I know Bob Bloomfield, his history is not to do one damn thing. Wayne? Notice uh, you violated your rules by letting those rich white people speak independently when you're supposed to bunch them. You know, you guys, you guys just bend over for certain people while you fuck us that come here. You don't apply the rules equally. You know, Dawson's back there walking all over the place, pacing back and forth. Look, man, if you don't want to be here, just quit. You know, you can go back to nonprofits with your. $400 million grant on your website there, you know. You got too much talent, Dawson, to be here with these schmucks. Believe Mr. me, I read, I read your background. I read, no, Mr. please no, address the yeah. whole board, I'm not talking any about, particular council member. Right, Thank I, you. I'm talking about the fact that you got a guy here in Harris, Dawson. He's got too much talent to be here, wasting his time in this fucking place. Get, get out in the community and create some jobs. I read, read his resume. The guy's got a lot of skills. The rest of you are fucking losers. You stay here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think that ends our uh, committee. There's no more items on the agenda. Welcome again, Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you.